briefly introduce this afternoon's event, uh, and then I'll hand it off to our student grantees for their presentations. Uh, so thank you all for coming to uh, the presentations of this year's Architecture Student Research Grant Projects. Uh, the AASRG is one of the more unique opportunities we extend to students every year here at Taubman, and one that I think really aligns with some of the most um, compelling aspects of our architecture program. So when I talk to colleagues at other institutions or uh, to prospective students or even to our uh, own students and faculty as we strive to articulate what is special about this place, I often describe our architecture program as one that is committed to experimentation. Many of our faculty and students really push the boundaries, challenging what might constitute the discipline of architecture in the 21st century. We work across and between disciplinary silos. We question and rewrite received and canonical histories, and we experiment with new technologies, design methods, and ways of working. And in doing so, our school hosts a plurality of nascent disciplinary futures. And this context really, it, it asks a lot of our students. It requires that they be nimble and open-minded, even as they're just beginning to build their disciplinary capacities. But at our best, I think this context welcomes students into a really vital and dynamic culture of research and discovery that prepares them for their futures in ever-changing professional and academic contexts. Um, and the Architecture Student Research Grant is one of the most vivid ways that we involve our students in the culture of our school uh, and, and the unique opportunities that come from studying architecture as you are in the context of a great research university. So the ASRG was um, originally initiated by the class of 2013 to provide an opportunity for self-directed student research projects. Um, the program is open to all Bachelor of Science, Master of Architecture, or doctoral students in the architecture program. And the call encourages applicants to articulate projects that push the boundaries of our discipline, working alone or in teams that can include members from across the university. So for this year, proposals were, re were reviewed by a jury consisting of our own faculty uh, for awards of $1,500 each. And this year's winners include Lindsay Barranco and Jamie Lee, whose project is titled Towards a Paper Architecture, Dan Shen, whose project is titled Portable Life Kit for Nomadic Beekeepers, Kaylee Tucker, Tyler Gaff, and Leonard Bopp, whose project is titled Music, Architecture, and the Spatialization of Sound. And I wanna particularly commend these students for finding ways to complete their projects even during a pandemic in which they didn't necessarily have access to the spaces and facilities they expected at the outset. outset. This is really remarkable. And so we'll hear, we'll hear presentations for each of these projects today. Um, but before we do, I wanna recognize that the architecture student research grants at Taubman would not be possible without the generous gift of our alumni, Adam Smith and Lisa Save of Synecdoche Design Studio in Ann Arbor. Um, Adam and Lisa, the college is proud to count you as alums. And we're so happy that your generosity will help our students to learn from your example and learn launching their own careers. So thank you. Uh, and with that, I think I'll hand it over to our first presenters. Thank you, McLean for um, introducing, um, should I just start sharing my screen or just get into um, the conversation? You be you, you go. Okay, okay, so, um, okay, uh, let me just get it started. Um, so is it full screen now? Um, everyone can see it? Um, You're good. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, I can't uh, see anything else other than my PowerPoint. So hi, everyone. My name is Dan, and I'm saying hello from China, and I'm currently in my second year of the 3G program. Um, so my research, Portable Life Kit for Nomadic uh, Beekeepers, focuses on the nomadic life of beekeepers in rural China, attempting to set up an authentic visual understanding of their working condition and their living environment of countryside. 
Then I designed a life kit prototype attempts to befit migrant labor living in their contemporarily assembled accommodation. I'll quickly sum up my research process and then show you the final design and how does the research process help contribute to it. Actually, I've re uh, redirected myself several times during the research because I found my understanding of architecture based on urban context could not be applied to a kid for uh, beekeepers who live a transient life in the wild, moving five to eight times a year to chase flower seasons to collect nectar as much as possible. Um, so um, the countryside occupies a disproportionate dis space in architectural discussions, considering the area it takes up and the number of people who inhabit it. So I started observing online and interviewing offline with beekeepers, trying to construct a narrative by themselves. So this is a site I visited in Qingyuan, Guangdong. And these are some camera, these are some live streaming um, screenshots from beekeepers that I have uh, been in contact with. Um, and during my research, I came, uh, several questions came to me, like how to define portable when beekeepers carry 160 pounds of bees and honey, repeating this 80 times within three hours and call it daily life, or how to define life when myself is in an urban context and away from beekeepers living environment and working conditions, or how to define kit when prefabricated kit becomes improvis improvisational and improvisational materials like metal boards torn down from trucks could become part of their, their tent. So by collecting video clips recorded by beekeepers and interviewing beekeepers, the video, I, I made a video aiming at documenting how beekeepers in rural China work, eat, sleep, travel, play, dance, and sing, and maybe social interact with one another. The video attempts to construct a visual understanding of the group of people, countryside, the relationship between body and the non-urban environment, uh, and the relationship between human and bees. At the end of the observation, the beekeepers' narratives and understanding of countryside contribute to the design of the kit, as you can see at the bottom here. Um, so I'll show you the final prototype first. Um, the common feature shared by beekeepers' accommodations I found during my research is that their living essentials, including tools, clothes, accessory, and food, are usually hang up on the walls of their temporary tents to fit in or enlarge narrow indoor space. So with this strong impression of hang status in beekeepers' tents, I designed a kit consisting of multi-purpose units hang, out, hang up on the wall, which could be reconfigured to accommodate the need of sheltering, gathering, and storing. So now I'm going to share a video of the research process. And um, if anyone can, oh, sorry, I need to, um, I guess I need to reshare it again. Wait. Uh, I need to go. Is it sound okay for you? Does the sound working or? I don't hear the sound. I can't hear, can't hear the sound. Oh, sh maybe share it again. Wait a sec. Oh yeah, there's, there's music. Then I think it is fine. Yes, it's fine. Um, let me pull it up again. Let me know if you can't hear music. Yes, we can hear. Yeah. Okay, 
朋友干的比较乏味一点，年下来也还行。如果你要是搞路线走不好，蜜蜂养不好，一年下来就是白干一年嘛。投多少钱投资进去，然后到年底你能呃上保留。前几年都养四百多箱了。如果说是养猫子一起走的话，有个几架子，一般装卸就是两个小时。如果没人的话，就我们父子两个装卸的话，得三个小时。我们今天出门了，这是我们家的蜂场。这些蜂箱已经全部打包好了。大家好，给你们看一下，我们现在已经到这个目的地了哈。今天蜂蜜上的非常好。今天我们搬家走了，把蜜蜂全部抓满。现在拆帐篷，就是天气太差了，给你下场雨。这是我们家的蜂场，一百五六十箱蜜蜂，今天全部装车带走。我们去采下场里的花。我们到达目的地了哈，已经干到天亮了。我们一夜没睡啊。这些蜂箱已经全部打包好了，大家直接挑就可以了。看一看走了，我们去采安吉白沙的花粉，绿场里面最好的。嗯、这些是分出来的小箱，这个是帐篷的门板，然后这边是装蜂蜜的蜂蜜桶，把什么打满带回家。这是一辆六米八的车，会装的很紧。也有好几个，喜欢摆几个都可以，这样很方便的。
Okay, so this will be the end of um, the presentation and I will share my website so that people can uh, revisit it. Um, okay, thanks for um, listening. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Barranco. And I'm Jamie. Uh, we are 3G MRC students at Talvin, and we're both in our final semester. Uh, we're excited to share our ASG work with you all today. Mm -hmm. do I need to do screen one or two? Amazing. Yeah, let's go. Okay, so um, okay, are we still muted? Oh no, great. Okay, so if everyone can see, we're gonna scroll through um, this website while we um, talk about our work. Um, so our project, our project is called Towards a New Paper Architecture. And it's an interrogation of unconventional building materials that inspire novel curved forms. Um, inflatable formwork made from latex is used to create objects made from recycled paper that provide different functionalities and haptic experiences. So during this really quick presentation, we'll explain a little bit about what inspired our research. Um, then we'll talk about our objectives over the course of the nine months since we received the grant. And then we'll finally talk about our making process and show you the results. Um, so what you can see now is um, a final result, but scrolling down, this is um, some imagery from our Situation Studio project when we were partners two winter terms ago. Um, so we experimented with paper pulp as um, a building material and we quickly became very passionate about um, developing new applications for paper and architecture. We were really inspired by, or maybe motivated by, the amount of waste that we see piling up all over our school, which I'm sure if there are students on this call, they're pretty familiar with <laughs> what studio looks like, especially after final projects. Um, so we wanted to promote like renewable resources um, in our creations. So the prospects of this ASRG grant were exciting to us because we could push the scale here, um, which is in terms of the objects we've created very small, like handheld, but we really wanted to push the scale bigger with this grant and kind of hone in on our making process and um, become more experts in the technique. So um, throughout the course of the nine months, our main objectives were um, just enhancing the design thinking about our initial stu studio project and then um, developing a stronger narrative about sustainability. Yeah, so the the uniqueness about developing in scale is that, you know, what Lindsay was mentioning about this are all one to one. You know, they're more like scale models, scale figures that we developed through a series of experiments with balloon forming and balloons that we will buy. But in developing all this, so all this um, images that you see right now are actually uh, photogrammetry. We developed photogrammetry techniques to kind of scan them, put it inside 3D models, to imagine them in building scale but and then but the next question was more about how we could decide we thought about how we want to gain you know autonomy and control over the forms that we have through pneumatic form work so pneumatic form work through new further research and you know that we have had is that inflatables and pneumatic form work are very really um intriguing parts of uh, many of many different industries from engineering to fashion so on and so forth Pneumatic form is even used, particularly in construction methods as well. Um, and in this, we thought about, we experimented with a ton of materials, I would say, that from, from plastics to latex to mylar, 
But the main premise of the idea is to work on the idea of elasticity, uh, which we kind of identify as a way of form finding and form making. We thought, okay, we bought balloons in our previous trip, but what if we want to gain autonomy over, you know, the forms through making and fabricating these inflatables ourselves. So what, what you see in this image is a result of um, a lot of trials and error and finding the right material and adhesives and, and, and seaming techniques which we have developed, which we have used as forms for our final exhibition. And um, to, but to help us with this process, we understood that it could be a complicated one. So in which we have used grass topple, in which particularly kangaroo, in which um, is more of a constraint solver, which allows us to analyze different forms that we have, that we have developed the script in understanding what is the relationship between the planar geometry, planar surfaces that we have that are seen in relation to how they're inflated and how they might look like. So we kind of green and, 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 and realize that that the curvy linear form are actually the most intriguing part of all this uh, bulbous forms that all the panels that have been curvy have led to results that were favorable in the language that we want to develop towards. Um, and so the results that you've seen um, along the way through, these are some of the images that we have shot and developed. Yeah. So uh, but first, let's perhaps we can show you a video of what we have done. So I'm going to reshare my screen. And then make sure I'll um, share computer sound. So it is a short video that we have developed. And here we go. <laughs> Share our other screen. Um, 
we can quickly talk about, I guess, some like findings that we had from setting up the exhibit. Um, it was a real joy to see people um, safely interact with our objects. Um, because I think something that we're both so interested in is how people interact with these and like touch and feel them because they're such sensory objects. Um, so it was really nice to be able to set up this exhibit for that purpose. Um, and I think they really come to life in a new way compared to our previous work in um, studio at a different scale. And I think adding light to them was also something that we had been talking about throughout the course of the year and trying to figure out how to, to do that. Um, and with the use of new apertures, um, we think there's, it kind of just broadens the, the way that these objects can act and function. And so to add on a little bit about how, you know, the way we represent, you know, in thinking about the techniques of representation and, and then perhaps I know that the video might be sparking a lot of laughter behind the screens right now as we're talking, you know, in the past three minutes, you know, the video. I think the whole idea is that, you know, in thinking about the ecology of the material and post-consumer production and how and how post-consumer waste is actually developed and used is that we're trying to give value to the use of waste and a different way of seeing how paper is used in a different light. And the truth is that, you know, we started collecting all these waste products that we had from glues to um, paper, so on and so forth, since COVID when everybody left the building in Tom College. And I think the whole point of, of this exhibition, you know, in, 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 in re-estheticizing the way in which we portray paper um, through different forms that are, um, oh, okay, sorry. To re-estheticizing re how um, paper is actually used in different interior products that you see right now on, on various different, many different scales, is trying to make people really think that about its value, its potential uses, and its potential I mean, I think that a lot of ecological problems today can be solved through a different approach and mindset that could be potentially not only scientific, but poetic, through the arts, through, you know, through video production or through different ways of production. How can, how can we speculate about more interesting ways of production that can potentially fuel the way we solve the problem of race, especially in this world? And so similarly, I think as architects, I think we have a lot of agencies and having this social responsibility of, you know, being able to make a difference in the world through systemic thinking. And I think that we are thinkers and thinkers. And I think that there's a lot of ways in which we can, we hope to inspire as well as not only just inspire, we hope that through our own work, we can encourage ourselves to, um, you know, continue forth in this. Um, so in this image that you see, is the disintegration of people uh, as an object so that, you know, while, you know, while we kind of try to show it as a razzle dazzle object, I think beyond this, it's just simply a thin shell that is decomposable and that is the ways it's kind of returned back to ways. I think the main idea over here is that, you know, in the architectural field, there's a cultural monumentalization and permanence. And rather than that, we want to seek the ephemerality of our objects in thinking about not trying to create more ways that we don't know where to put or what to do with, but the fact that the ways that is used is kind of returned back to this life cycle of being a waste product on its own. Um, is there anything mm -hmm. to add? No, I think you got it. Okay, I think with that, we, um, we end our uh, presentation. We can, should we share the link now? Perhaps. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, we can paste the link to the site that we've been showing you already. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, um, especially to Adam and Lisa for giving this grant year, year after year, and for everyone that helped us in our Taubman community. It was a really, really rewarding project to work on. You know, we have a lot of friends to, to thank. Um, uh, thank you, McLean, for letting us cause trouble, <laughs> um, as well as, um, you know, many of our friends, colleagues, uh, yeah. Laura Brown. And, um, <laughs> Many stars and friends. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.
Um, hello, my name is Tyler Gaff, and I'm joined by research partners Kaylee Tucker, a fellow MR candidate, and Leonard Bopp, a Master of Orchestral Conducting candidate in the School of Music. Before we begin, we would like to extend a quick thank you to Taubman College, the Arts Engine, and everyone involved in the ASRG program for making this research possible through funding and support throughout the process. Music architecture and the spatialization of sound is an interdisciplinary collaboration with the goal of exploring new modes of engagement between music, architecture, and their respective audiences. While plenty of research has illustrated the parallels between the two disciplines, our work focused on the codified language of scores and construction documents, the instructions produced in order to realize musical and architectural works. Through a series of exercises and studies, we have spent the past months breaking down the layers of symbology and jargon that compose these critical forms of dispatch, working back and forth between each discipline to create realizations that convey the qualities of both fields in more accessible formats. So to begin our research, we started by looking at precedents in both of our fields um, that we thought articulated um, an early nexus of intersections between these two disciplines. Um, this centered at first on a discussion of early notation um, and early ways of communicating um, both musical notation and architectural planning through uh, different methods of notation and symbology. Um, but then we discussed more at length two uh, more recent pieces that we felt really highlighted these intersections. The first is a piece by John Cage from the 1980s, a series of pieces actually. Um, for these pieces, Cage made prints tracing 15 different stones from the Ryuanji Garden in Kyoto, Japan. The performers are then instructed to interpret these curves as the contour of their line played as glissandi, which are sliding between pitches um, within the range of their instruments. So we discussed how in this piece, an architectural work becomes the direct inspiration for musical material, but moreover, the drawings are actually repurposed as a form of musical notation. So a representation of physical objects um, are translated, so to speak, into a musical medium. We also discussed the recent collaboration between Ashley and Adam Fure, The Force of Things, which is an immersive installation in which speakers within this space emit sounds too low for humans to hear, but that cause the sculpted material seen here to resonate. So in this piece, like The Cage, we talked about how a sonic experience becomes dictated in large part by an architectural work. Um, much of the musical material is in the piece is the result of these resonant objects. However, in this immersive experience, the physical space itself is activated by sonic material, the low frequencies coming from the subwoofers. So in this way, sound and space enter a sort of reciprocal relationship in which each element of the installation activates and makes the other possible. To start thinking about the types of disciplinary content encoded in the scores and plans, we began by individually annotating a document from each field. Um, and we deliberately chose not to collaborate on a method, but had the common goal of notating anything that we felt would need to be explained to those outside the discipline. Um, through discussing our products from the exercise, we identified two basic strategies, which we've called global and local. Um, global annotations marked each document as a template for the entire discipline, explaining symbols in terms of their general function or position on a page in a way that would be true in other documents, while local acted as a document specific analysis. Each symbol's meaning was explained in terms of its exact nuanced application in that particular instance. We realized that in both disciplines, a direct translation of their instructions would be impossible for most of the symbols they contain because so few of these symbols are, are truly exact and certain. Many are relational or referential to other things within the same document or require interpretive instincts that can only be attained through further study in the discipline. So our next step was looking at Anthony Damari and Nora Yu's Operative Design, um, which is a book that presents 30 base verbs and how they volumetrically or spatially operate. We set out to define um, each of these terms and started from a non-disciplinary standpoint and just looked at the word itself. And then each of us added definitions according to our disciplines. Since all of us came with different understandings of each word, we amassed multiple definitions that we then used in our next steps. So for the next steps, we decided that um, we would try to translate the 
uh, musical definitions that we came up with based on the Damari and you verbs um, into actual musical ideas. So what I did was I created um, just a very basic musical idea, um, a simple, relatively stepwise uh, pattern in the key of G minor. And I took that as the bass motif, similar to the idea of like um, the bass that the verbs manipulate. Um, I then manipulated this musical idea based on the musical definition of the spatial verb that I had come up with, creating a series of related short phrases that try to illustrate directly these points. Um, so for most of these phrases, I simply kept a, sing a single voice and played with things like uh, the length, extensions or contraction, rhythm going slower or faster, or pitch um, expanding and register. Um, but for others, I decided to add a second voice. So for example, in expand, um, rather than that initial bass motif, I stay in G minor, but I start with just an open fifth in the key of G minor. And then you'll see that one voice um, is a series of fifths that ascend and another is a series of fifths that descend. And so it creates this idea that the sound is pulling apart in terms of register. Another example is interlock. So in interlock, I took the basic pattern uh, that I came up with and simply delayed the second voice by a half a beat. And so this creates a canon where the voices interlock, the register remains pretty tight, um, but you'll hear and see how they crisscross over each other. So after Leonard wrote these phrases, uh, Tyler and I began devising ways to translate the phrases back into a spatial form. And to do this, we started by establishing a grid system. We used the existing staff and added additional lines uh, so that we could locate nodes both um, at the points uh, or at the lines and the spaces in the traditional musical notation. We then started establishing time markers um, and so we chose the unit to be a 16th note because that's the shortest note that any of the phrases use. Um, and from here, I added points to each note, locating them along the pitch axis and the time axis, so the y and the x axis respectively. Um, each point is located where the note begins, and then they're all connected one to the next uh, to create a continuous line and produce the final graphic representation. So. Through this process, we found that image in the traditional musical notation can be actually hidden by the notation itself. While all of the phrases appear to be the same length uh, when they're written out on the staff because they you know, take up the same amount of space, um, you can tell when re-representing them uh, graphically that um, that's not actually true. Uh, the longer notes are represented with correspondingly longer spacing in this uh, graphic re-representation. And uh, you can tell that a phrase like inflate has significantly longer spacing, um, which indicates it's longer length and time in comparison to something very small um, like merge. So this method starts to show uh, larger trends in phrases. Um, it doesn't rely on disciplinary notation, uh, like these symbols that show note length um, in the original musical phrase. Um, so these representations begin to make trends readable for non-musicians. So for inflate, for example, like Leonard described, you can kind of see how these lines are pulling apart and graphically inflating just like they're musically inflating. Um, and you have an upper register and a lower register. In interlock, the same principle applies. So you can see the ways that the two lines interact and lock into each other without having to actually know how to read that music. For our final exercise in translation, Leonard suggested we use a 16th century motet composed by Thomas Morley as the starting media for the process 
because of its simple three note motif that is passed between each of the six parts during the piece's progression. Building from earlier process, uh, the earlier process, we maintained the same time marking structure as before, but added a component to describe the articulation or quality and volume of each pitch in addition to its duration and frequency. Using a system, I was able to build a line graphic for each of the six voices, space those components evenly, and then generate a surface geometry based on the parameters of those individual segments. So working from Tyler's surface geometry, we thought it would be interesting to try essentially a process of retranslation, which was um, trying to realize the surface, um, which was of course a spatial realization of the motet um, to realize the surface musically, so to speak. So um, what I tried to do was uh, interpret the Y axis of Tyler's diagram as pitch and the X axis as time. Um, this allowed for each new voice to enter at a higher pitch. Um, and it also allowed for the contour lines where they grow closer together, so do the pitches, where they grow more distant from each other, they expand in repertoire. It's not an exact matchup, of course, because I was also thinking in musical terms, but the idea was to illustrate the kinds of contours um, and spaces that this surface points to. Um, Tyler then made a um, animation that combines an overview of the surface with the music, and we'll hear a little bit of that now. So um, it was important in doing this that um, I really tried not to even think about the uh, uh, Morley or especially that initial three mo motif, which was the reason for choosing the piece. Um, what we found through this process was that through this process of retranslation, this kind of dialogue can lead not necessarily to a return to the original product or medium, but to evolving results, meanings, and interpretations. But we also found that this speaks to the subjectivity with which people in either field and people in general interpret both sonic and spatial notations and materials. So <clears throat> in addition to these explorations that we've done, we're also working um, on a survey to evaluate how some of these re different representations can be understood by people in different disciplines. And we're working with Oliver Popovich to develop an interactive builder, which will allow you to uh, build a graphic and sonic composition with the phrases that you saw earlier. Um, so you can check back soon on our website uh, to test it out. Um, you'll be able to uh, build compositions using the words, uh, like the spatial diagrams from Damari and you, the sound itself, or the graphic representations that we created. Um, you'll be able to follow along graphically and as you listen to the composition, so you'll experience it both spatially and sonically. Um, that's it, thanks. And I'll share the website in the chat for everyone. Okay, um, I think it's on me to wrap things up here again. Thank you to uh, all of the teams for the fantastic work. Uh, and to anybody who has uh, just signed on or who has signed on late, uh, again, these teams submitted these grants assuming that it would end in a physical installation uh, in our gallery and had to um, sometimes pretty radically reimagine the project so that they would live online. So I'm um, pasting the websites for the first two projects we saw today uh, to go along there with uh, with Kaylee, Tyler, and, and Leonard's project. So please, um, at your leisure, go and spend some more time with all of these projects. I think it's fantastic work across the board, students. So congratulations. Uh, and to any students who are watching, be on the lookout for um, this year's uh, call for the ASRG grant, uh, which we hope to have coming out in the near future. Thanks again to Lisa and Adam and to everybody who came today. See you all soon.